I've been a hip hop fan since the late 1970s. And I've also been a journalist for the past 30 years. It's crazy how much of a, uh, a role, uh, a sizable, substantial role hip hop has played in my life over the past 40 plus years. There's some artists who've definitely stuck with me and impacted me um, over the decades. And, and Karis One is one of them. I first became aware of Karis One in 1986. Uh, I was listening to a radio station here in Toronto, actually a college radio station, and there was a program on the show called the Fantastic Voyage Program. I, I thought stylistically, Karis One had something. Uh, I didn't like the fact that he was taking a shot at Shan because, you know, at that point I was a huge Juice Crew fan. So obviously Molly Mall was the, the main producer. He was the, we'll say the leader. And then by 87 now, the battle was in full swing. So Shan responded to South Bronx with Kill That Noise. And I thought, okay, a little light. He could have come a little heavier in terms of his attack or his response, but I was like, okay, cool. He responded, he responded. But then Karis One came with the bridges over. He came with the bridges over. It's definitely a, a heavier handed song than Kill That Noise. At the time, I was bothered by the song, to be honest with you. I'm not gonna front and act like, I was like, yo, man, this song is dope. People thought it was people thought it was great. I didn't think it was great. Because first of all, Karis One is not Jamaican. Karis One is not Jamaican at all. I saw an interview with uh, Kenny Parker, his younger brother, who became a DJ and a part of BDP back in 1990. Uh, you know, they grew up, they're, like, they're less than a year apart. And, you know, Kenny has a book out, a memoir that talks about their upbringing, him and, him and Karis One, or his brother Chris, as he refers to him. But basically, his mother, when they were children, so when, when Karis One and Kenny Parker were children, started dating a Jamaican gentleman. And this would have been back in the 70s. And so apparently this particular Jamaican individual introduced the two of them to reggae music in the 70s, Bob Marley in particular. And it turns out that, you know, that was the, the impetus. That was the impetus for Karis One's fascination and really obsession with, with reggae music and, and Jamaican culture. I believe Kenny Parker said he'd bought a, um, a Bob Marley album. I believe it was a, a Rastaman Vibration album at the age of 10. Karis One, you know, going back to the bridge or the bridge is over, sorry. I wasn't a fan of that song. I'll be honest with you. I just thought this Jafakin shit, because that's what they call it in, in, in African-American culture. And Karis One is absolutely Jafakin. He's just faking it, straight up and down. Like, I love for Karis One. You know, I think he lyrically, he's dope. He was dope from the beginning, 86, 87. But I never liked this wannabe Jamaican thing or just faking thing. I, I was never a fan of that. Karis One lyrically, when he rhymes, if he wants to speak in Ebonics, if he wants to speak just plain English, cool really that jafakin shit is whack i'm sorry i don't i don't like that never been a fan so when the bridge is over dropped and people were losing their minds i wasn't losing my mind i was bothered by it i thought dude stick to the english stick to ebonics leave the jamaican thing alone man i like the criminal minded album i do i do there are other songs on there there's you know super ho there's um there's poetry there's some dope songs on that album without question there's the title track criminal minded there's some dope songs on that album without question i can't front on the album but i don't i don't like the jafakin thing straight up and down i can't even, i'm not even gonna mince words with that i don't like that at all but that year even before the year was up scott la rock was murdered which is crazy which is i i just remember hearing that thinking scott la rock he died he was murdered you know i remember ron nelson mentioning about scott la rock got killed Tragic, very tragic. Then you look at, by all means necessary. My philosophy, you're slipping. I'd have to say straight up and down that by all means necessary is arguably their best album. I would say as a collective. I'm still number one, dope. Part-time suckers. I'd have to say by all means necessary is the best album. Yeah, like you go down the line and pretty much 80, 90% of the album is dope. Just dope stuff, you know. So I would absolutely say there was an upgrade from album number one to album number two, without question, without question. March of that year, March of 88, I went to see BDP in concert. BDP came down and with special guests, Just Ice. So, you know, my friend Eric and I went to the concert, downtown Toronto, concert hall. And to be honest with you, I wasn't really excited by the show. I thought, I thought it was kind of anticlimactic. 
I, I didn't I didn't feel that Carol's one really gave me anything that exciting on stage. He seemed like he was kind of going through the motions. And maybe he was just still dealing with the the loss of Scott LaRock. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I wasn't excited by his performance, you know. But I thought I thought the material on the album, by all means necessary, was dope. Very dope. And then I went away. I, I went away basically in August of uh, 88. I moved to Jamaica. Moved to Jamaica and didn't get back until 19 end of 1989 so it was december of 1989 so when i got back i remember i went to go check my friend eric and he had the third bdp album third bdp album ghetto music the blueprint of hip-hop and you know he played some for me and i thought yeah i'm not really not really feeling that not really feeling that album yeah it just just, like nothing really jumped out at me nothing really jumped out at me and i thought you know and obviously you know, at that point, I'd been away for a little over a year. You know, I was out of the mix. I mean, I was hearing music and Jama- hip hop in Jamaica, but I wasn't hearing all the albums. But I can tell you right now, I still don't know that album. Uh, I think, you know, I know Jack of Spades. You must learn, I like. But beyond that, I just really wasn't a fan of that album. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of that album. So, yeah, I, I was like, scrap. It never jumped out at me. It never jumped out at me. Uh, and then the next year, 1990, uh, they put out Edutainment, and it just, another one did not grab me. Yeah, that was another one in a row. The Edutainment album, um, I like Love's Gonna Get You. I thought that was kind of cool, but I wasn't blown away by anything on that album. Not a fan, not a fan. So really, I was thinking, Karis, why not? You need to pull it together, man. These, these albums are not happening. I was not feeling that album. And then there was the uh, the live album live hardcore worldwide i remember a, a homeboy i knew what's his name dre andre he owned it and he was trying to he was trying to promote it to me i was like nah. and then came 1992 and i started hearing songs like like a throttle uh we in there i was like yo duck down i was like yo this shit sounds dope wicked tunes man i was like yo okay this is what I want to hear now. This is kind of kind of cleanse the palate, clean clean the slate, so to speak. When it came to BDP, I thought, okay, this shit sounds wicked. This shit is knocking. When I heard we in there, I was like, oh my god, this stuff sounds nuts. Sounds nuts. And so I started hearing that stuff, and I got word that they were performing. They were coming to Toronto for '92 BDP, and it was BDP uh, with Chia Lee as the uh the guest the guest artist and she Ali had you know funky road runner and whatever else that funky road runner was a joint i believe beat i believe beat nuts had produced that if i'm not mistaken beat nuts yeah it was beat nuts dope song dope song don't beat anyway she Ali was all right lyrically so went to the show man oh man oh man like i made it delivered now you're going from 86 to 1992 so you know you're looking at six years now six if you want to say seven years so he had honed his stage presence they rocked that shit oh my goodness man like i mean because he went back he was doing tracks off the first album right on up i was impressed i was impressed with the album i was impressed with the performance and so that put me back in good standing with karis one like karis one is back I just felt he, I felt like he came back. And then comes 1993. And I'm like, Karis One is working with Premiere? I was like, oh my gosh. I, I, it blew my mind. Because at that point, you know, I was what? At 1993 is three Gangstar albums in. Yeah, so there was a, No More Mr. Nice Guy. There was Step in the Arena, 1991. And then there was Daily Operation, which is my favorite Gangstar album. So I start hearing songs off Return of the Boom Bap. Um, the Return of the Boom Bap, I don't even know what I first heard. I don't know if it was Mortal Thought. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure what I heard first off that album. Not completely sure. But that album, oh my gosh, that album, wow. Return of the Boom Bap. Return of the Boom Bap was even better than Sex and Violence. So Sex and Violence was dope. Return of the Boom Bap was even better. Even better. So I was like, yo, Karis One is back. From a musical standpoint, he's back. I thought, this is some dope shit. I was impressed. I was impressed. I was impressed. Can't front. Can't front, man. Can't have fronts. You know, everything is never going to remain perfect. There's always going to be ups and downs. But he released 
the return of the boom bap as a video it was more or less a medley of various songs from the album and there's a part in the video where he says i am the god of rap and i thought oh no krs what i mean krs one you know he never made it a secret that he was a cocky dude he's a cocky son of a gun yeah he's a leo he says um, leo the lion he doesn't hide and you know most of the leos i know not all of them but most of them are pretty cocky people yeah they're, they're very self-assured and pretty they have pretty inflated egos but Karis, when he said that I am the god of rap, I was like, ah, oh, Karis. It just sounded like some whack shit. I was like, that's whack. That hurt my perception of him without question. That absolutely hurt my perception of him. But what are you going to do, man? 1994 came and he was back in Toronto. So this is like two years later. And I believe the venue was Spectrum. Yeah, in downtown. And I went. It didn't feel like 92, obviously, because it wasn't 92. And it was a little a little removed from um, the release of um, Return of the Boom Bap. I would have preferred that he came the year the album came out, but he didn't. That's okay. I went, 94, he brought M.O.P. And at the time, I believe I'd heard How About Some Hardcore, uh, M.O.P.'s um, debut single. He put on a decent show, but then some jackass threw a stink bomb and, and, and delayed the show. I believe the show was delayed for like maybe half hour, but like, you know, he put something over his mouth, stepped off the stage, and he came, you know, I think everybody kind of moved out of the vicinity and let the place air out. But about a half hour later, he he, he finished his show. He finished his show, and I was like, all right, he's a trooper, man. He definitely, you know, he got paid for the show. Why leave? It's not like, it's not like they blew the place up, but they smoked the place out with a stink bomb. Like I said, not the 92 show, but a decent show. It was a decent show. Yeah, I can't front. It was a decent show. Yeah, I mean, um, but nothing, nothing's going to compare to that show, that 92 show. Nothing. Nothing's going to compare to that. And then 1995. 1995. He put out the self-titled album. The self-titled album. Karis One. Karis One. I still had mixed feelings about Karis One at that point because of that whole I am the god of rap. And the 94 show was okay. Yeah, it was okay. So he comes back in 95 with a new album, self titled Karis One. But there was some joints on there. He came back with some primo stuff. Uh, rappers are in danger. MCs act like they don't know. He came down with Mad Lion that year, 1995. So Mad Lion and Channel Live came. I can't recall the venue. I don't know if it was um, Opera House. I, I can't recall the venue at this point, but I went with a homeboy of mine and my brother, my younger brother, Kevin. The show itself, once again, I wasn't excited by it. I thought it was okay. That was an okay show. 1997 now, there was a, a press conference for Karis One's next album, I Got Next. And I went and I thought, okay, because at this point I'm thinking, eh, I'm not really the Karis One fan anymore. I still think he's one of the dopest to ever do it lyrically. In a hip hop context, can't front on Karis One and that. But from an album standpoint, and even from a show standpoint, just wasn't really feeling Karis One at this particular juncture. In 1997, I was like, eh. But you know, being media, at this at this point, I was definitely deeper in the media game. At this point, I had, you know, I was writing for publications in in Toronto. And I was definitely more of a fixture. People knew me in the industry. So this was, you know, from 1994 to 1997, you know, quite a, quite, quite a bit had happened, you know, in terms of my, my profile. I definitely became a fixture in the, in the Toronto, um, Toronto music industry in terms of dealing with record labels and writing for recognized outlets, media outlets. I Got Next was his 1997 release and I went and I went to the press conference. That particular album, when I think about it from a song standpoint, what was really on that album? Um, the MC, yeah, the MC is a dope song. Can't front on that. That to me, without question, dope, dope song. He also had a song called A Friend. I like that one as well. But in general, nah, those are the only two songs that really jumped out at me on that album. I was like, nah, not feeling that album. Not feeling that album. But that's the 90s. That is the 90s, or those are the 90s. And, and things were just very different after that. I just started checking in. I started checking in 2003. I mean, I listened to Spiritual Minded and HMV. I, I don't even remember. That album's a blur to me. I don't remember that. I just kind of, you know, they had a they used to have samplers with headphones in the store. You could listen to albums. I listened to that. Eh, nothing special. Chris Styles was better in 2003. Also, I listened to HMV. It's like, eh. But I never actually bought an album. These are albums that never came home with me. 
never owned them. Uh, and that was that. I think the most significant album I heard within that time frame would have been in 2007, which was the Hip Hop Lives album with Marley Maul. I was like, Marley Maul and Kara, so you dissed him at 87. And then you fast forward basically 20 years later, and all as well. I mean, here's the deal. I mean, Kara was a different person, obviously, in 1987. He was like, you know, in his 20s. And this is him now in his 40s. And it was pretty interesting that him and Molly Maul collaborated, you know, on the album Hip Hop Lives. I mean, there are people who stopped listening to Karis One in the 90s. I was like, okay, let me keep, let me check out what he's doing now. What is he doing now? But that was probably the most significant one that jumped out at me. I thought, wow, Karis One is messing with Molly Maul. Hip Hop Lives is a dope track, though. That's that's probably my my favorite song on that album. But to be honest with you. I, I don't even know that album. I, I can't say that I know. I skimmed through it, but I can't say I actually know that album. Other than Hip Hop Lives and the video for that song there, I, I can't say I know that album. That album is not, not an album that I'm familiar with. He put out um, two albums in 2010. Uh, Meta Historical with uh, True Master from Wu-Tang fame. And then he put out Godsville in um, the same year with Show or Showbiz from Showbiz and AG. And I continue to check in. 2017, The World Is Mind. That's not a bad album. You know, I, I think I think the, the production uh, could have been better. But lyrically, Karis One, like I said, he hasn't lost a step. He's still dope. He's still he's still intelligent. He's still creative. You know, he gets his props still. I can't front. Like the one thing that has not dwindled, his skills have not dwindled. He's kept his he's kept his, his skills sharp. Uh, I may not always like the production on the albums. So Karis One has a new album, 2022. I'm an MC, are you one too? He still got it. Karis One has not lost a step lyrically. I don't like all the production on there. I think I probably like maybe four or five songs on the album, but Karis One is still dope, which is incredible. It's incredible that a dude can be around, you know, at this point we're going into 37 years and he still sounds dope. So it just goes to show that he continues to work on his, his craft. He's, he takes that shit very seriously. And I big him up on that. I big him up on that. Now he's still doing the Jafakin thing because I believe there's a one or two songs on that album. I don't like it. I really don't like it. I didn't like it from the bridge is over right up to the present time. 36, 37 years later, I didn't like it then and I don't like it now. But what are you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? Karis One remains etched in my top three. He's number three. Kane number one, Rakim number two, Karis one number three of all time, of all time. And that list is not going to change because we're not talking about what they're doing now. I mean, I could say in the case of Karis one, I give him props that he's still around and he's still doing it. I'm not going to act like Big Daddy Kane and, and, and Rock Kim are still doing what they were doing in their prime. No, but it's not about that. It's about what they did in their prime and how they changed the game forever. Big Daddy Kane, number one on my list of all time. Rock Kim, number two all time MCs. And Karis one number three. That's my list. That's not changing. Number four, Cool G Rap, all time. Number five, Slick Rick, all time. That's my top five. Kane, Rakim, Karis one, Cool G Rap, and Slick Rick of all time. Those are my top five. And they're not changing. I'm not adding anyone to that list. That's the list of all time. 